So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to my home. Thank you for having me. My name is Adam Albright, and I have the esteemed privilege of interviewing Charlie Brown for the Drag Queen Oral History Project at Georgia State University's Library Special Collections. It's Tuesday, March 26th, 2019, and I feel very honored to have been invited into your home. Uh, and having this conversation, Charlie lives in Austell, Georgia. Um, I'm a redneck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, like I said, to kind of get going, I think the best place to start is at the very beginning. Well, um, welcome you to up? my home, everybody. Did yeah. you grow up in the South? Are you from? No, I grew up on Georgia. Uh, a missionary Baptist community in northern Tennessee called Westmoreland, Tennessee. Oh. And my grandfather founded 80% of the missionary Baptist churches in that area. So I was raised in this real strict Baptist upbringing. Uh, I couldn't ask for better parents. Yeah. The uh, church I went to was a small community church. Everybody knew everybody in the community. And if you did something wrong, everybody knew it before sunset. And one of our neighbor girls got pregnant. And my mother started preaching to me how dirty it was. And this is why I was a little boy, about six. Coffee pot bread. Coffee pot. I was about six years old when one of the girls in the neighborhood got pregnant. And so my mother started preaching to me automatically what a sin it was. But she didn't say nothing about the neighborhood boys that was five, six years older than me. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started messing around with guys older than me with the tension, being part of it. Part of, and of course, I was always by myself with them when they wanted to be my friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I graduated from high school, went on to mission, went on to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, to drum business college, and I was studying computers, and I was discovered homosexuality and full blown there, and loved it. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. So I was there for a while. To my parents found out they met, come and got me, made me move out of Nashville. I went to Florida and stayed with friends. I continued to be gay there too. Uh, periods of times, it's hard for me to remember the years. I'm 69 right now to put all the years with everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, went back, ended up moving to Nashville and then leaving with a friend of mine to move to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and I was there for a while. I hadn't started drag at that point, but I was seeing drag. In Myrtle, Beach. First, in Myrtle Beach for, for the, the first time. time. But he wasn't on the show, it was just little drag queens in bars. Oh. That one would come in, they'd let her do a number, pan them out, whatever was on the jukebox then. Uh -huh. And so I was there for a period of time, and then I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was there working at Holiday Inn, and I was one of the desk clerks took me to see a gypsy fortune teller. And she told me, she looked straight in my eyes and told me, said, you're the third sex and your career is waiting in Nashville, Tennessee, where I was from. She didn't know that, but she knew it. She read me like a book. Mm. What do you think she meant by that, the third, the third sex? I was gay. Okay. She didn't, she didn't say gay. Yeah. She said the third sex. Well, I moved back to Nashville, Tennessee. My first night there, some friends of mine took me to see a drag show. They had six entertainers. And right before the show started, they announced that they needed a male lead and a sound man. And I just moved back and I applied for the job and got it. And so I did male parts in the, at the Watch Your Hat and Coat Saloon in Nashville, Tennessee. What was the name of the saloon? Watch, Watch Your Hat and Coat. Watch Your Hat and Coat. Saloon in Nashville, Tennessee. 
So I did male part there until we did a thing called turnabouts. And that's where the males did the drag and the drag did the bark tin and the waiting tables and all that. Everything. But I was already doing male parts in the show. And I, I was good. <laughs> and I started doing the shows once a week and then worked into two twice a week and three times a week. At that time, what would you, what type of drag would you say? Like, how would you characterize? If, um, uh, drag then was the best you could do in makeup. Yeah. Uh, you found friends that would help you with wigs and some drag queens. Well, luckily, the club I worked at, these queens were from Chicago and Indianapolis. They moved to Nashville to become in the show. And they could get my wigs and everything for me. But, uh, just who could sell for you, and you, if you could find something with a secret on it, you grabbed it at Goodwill, you know. But you worked your way into it, and you learned how to do it yourself, how to sew, how to decorate your costumes. I mean, if you learned how to make your fabric, so a, a pattern, every dress you had was in that pattern until you learned another one, you know. So it was rough, <laughs> real rough. But while I was there, they had a contest, Miss Gay America, the first Miss Gay America. And I took first runner up in it. A queen from Arkansas won it, Norma Christie from Arkansas won the contest. Do you and, remember about what year that would have been? Okay. 72? Yeah, about 72. Okay. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I graduated from 68, About 72. Then I went, entered Miss Gay Universe in Pensacola, Florida, and was first runner up in it. I went back to Nashville, continued to do shows and stuff, and uh, built my name up. Then one night, the club burnt. I was on stage and smoke boiled through the ceiling. And we barely got out with just what we could grab as we run through the dressing room. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there I went to Memphis, back to Nashville. I was hopscotching anywhere they'd give me a job. Yeah. Then I ended up in Atlanta. I was here for about, about two years, I think it was. And then I went back to Nashville to work in Printer's Alley a night. That's Big nightclub district in Nashville, Tennessee. Straight nightclub district. What was it called? Printer's Alley. Printer? Printer. P R I N T E R S. Printer's, Printer's Alley. Alley. Hmm. It used to be uh, ma magazines and newspaper area, and ah. they turned them into nightclubs, ah. million dollar nightclubs. And we was over at the top strip club in the country. Our show was over it. And so I really learned a lot about stripping. And I was there for a long time. And performing, about a year. would you say? Yeah, I was performing yeah. seven days a week. Yeah, so a lot of and it was all straight clientele, too. And so, left, went to a gay club in Nashville, same place, same city. There for about two months and moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's when I met Brad, my partner. I was in Knoxville for about six months. And things were going sour, and we moved to Atlanta. Now, this is about 70, 78. Early 78. Yeah. So, and that happened I, about the same time you're meeting Fred, and then y'all moving to Atlanta. Yeah, it was like meant to be. I said, let's move to Atlanta, and a friend drove us down here. We pulled off the interstate, and he was working for Sonicro. He said, let me check about a job. He walked out. They begged him to start that day, gave him $100 a week more in salary. We went to my friend's apartment, we stayed out with them, and I went up to see about getting an apartment. When I walked in, this woman went, oh my God, Charlie Brown, where have you been? She gave us the first last month rent, no deposits, no dark deposits. That night was a contest at the Sweet Gum Head. And I dressed up, we walked into the door, and I got hired before I got past the door. I mean, all this one day, it was like, you're going to Atlanta. Yeah. God said, go to Atlanta. So I was in, that was Sweet Gumhead. Hmm. OK. 
Okay. Let me break the powder down. Okay. Now drag it. So we go ahead. You was working. Sweet gum. Sweet S E S W E E T G U M. Gum head on Cheshire Bridge. Uh -huh. He was working with some of the best queens from all over the country. They brought him in from everywhere from Texas, Chicago, Hawaii, I mean, just everywhere. And it was, you had to work. We had things called bar wards that, uh, at that time, it was like about five clubs. Five clubs with full-time drag shows, and we had bar awards. Bar awards. 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 Okay. Like the Oscars. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I and see. that was the biggest nights of the year because every club brought their best productions, mm -hmm. and that's when they named Entertainers of the Year, the best productions of the year, best costumes. You know, that uh, just everything you could think of, best sound man techniques, and all that. The seamstresses, and I, through the periods of that, I, I won Entertainer of the Year. I won the British Sterling Award-winning Entertainer of the Year. I won Best Production, MC of the Year, Best Costume, and Charity Work. I did Charity Work. I won Best con Contributing to the com Gay Community Awards. Mm. I won the Outstanding Young Men's American Award by the American JCs for my work with the daycares during the child murders in Atlanta. I worked to help keep the daycares open, get benefits for them. Mm -hmm. And JCs honored me with that. So a lot of extra work outside of. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always given to the community. I mean, it, it, it give, they gave to me. Mm -hmm. They gave me. What do you mean? How do, you, how do you say a little bit more about that? How they gave to me? Well, that, 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 there. it sounds like a feeling and like something that really Oh, happened. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be what I am. I wouldn't be sitting in this house that I own mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for the gay community. And that's why I, I've always wanted to give back to my community because they've given me so much respect. And, you know, I've won pageants and they've been behind me. They've pushed me and worked with me and helped me. Yeah. And. It's something you don't do by yourself. Mm -hmm. My partner, he was the driving force behind me. Mm -hmm. He said, you can do it when I said, I can't do it. I can't do that. I found out I could because he pushed me into it. So he sort of lines up in one of your biggest supports. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, your, over the course of the late 70s um, and then moving around, Quite a few areas, I might add. Um, did you? What, what, what was your? Did you have family that were centralized still in Tennessee, or were they uh, my family, as well? My or? family uh, did not know. They would not have accepted it. They would not have accepted it. And when they did find out, my brother and I was never the same between us. Mm -hmm. My sister accepted it eventually. Just one brother and sister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my father and mother knew I did drag, mm -hmm. so, but we really never did discuss it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fred would go home with me and they'd treat him just like they would one of the daughter laws you know, or son-in-law. He was respected, but it was never really discussed. But my brother and I never, never could pull it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a process. I know it's a process that they <laughs> didn't make up at the same time. I'm sorry. That's great. Uh, great. But during the Gumhead days, it, that was the development of Atlanta, Georgia. And like we moved here in like early 78s, and I went to Georgia in 1980. At that time, uh, none of the entertainers were walking down the street. What do you mean? Uh, for gay pride, nobody because they were asked not to because of the media focused on them more than they did 
the gay pride function. Mm -hmm. and you so mean queens in general were involved in gay pride? <laughs> benefits. Benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I won 1980, I did gay pride and I've done it almost every year since. I have been grand marshal four times, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Most of the time, the latter years, I walked it instead of riding it. <laughs> it's cooler. Now, Charlie Brown, that, is, that, is that your given name or your... Charles name? Dillard's my given name. Charles Dillard. And I got the nickname Charlie Brown, working at a Holiday Inn. This is before I did drag. And... Uh, I worked the 3 to 11 shift, and right as the night clerk came in, I met to mess up the registers real bad. And she said, GD, Charlie Brown. And everybody started calling me Charlie Brown. And so when I, when I started drag, I went with the name Renee Walker. And Nashville come down on city ordinance that we had to have male names and Mr. in front of it. Mm, as performers. As performers. And as you walked in the door, you had to be told that you, everybody on that stage was a man. Every person, back to back to back, had to be mm -hmm. told that. Mm -hmm. So I went to Mr. Charlie Brown, mm -hmm. and I kept it. That in Tennessee would have been about the late, about 1970 or... Yeah, during the Hee Haw days. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole other story. Were they hee-haw days? Hee-haw days. They used to come and party with us every weekend if they get through filming. Yeah? Yeah. What's they were? What did they? How did that happen? They come see the show. Our show was like one of the best shows in Nashville at the time, you know. I mean, we did productions at that time at Carol Burnett's show. So. And as she did the sketches as the stomach turn, and we do them the next week in the show and was always doing stuff, comedy stuff from her show. And uh, our show pushed us to do comedy as much as serious. And it, it's really paid off for me over the years because I, I enjoy doing comedy. And I enjoy making people laugh. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about that, about sort of um, knowing that the way we talk about drag or performing or stuff changes over time. And I was wondering how you sort of would describe your style and how, and perhaps in various ways, like you just said, like is comedy being important? What are some other things that would you well, say? Well, I am C, and of course I've utilized the comedy in my MC. And Emceeing like the, the hosting, person who hosting the, the show. show. I host the shows. Okay. Uh, it was about 1980 when I I was in the dressing room and the club manager walked in. John Austin walked in the dressing room, handed me the microphone. He said, "You're the new MC." He just fired the other MC, and I'd never MC before in my life. I said, "I can't do this." He said, "Oh hell yeah, you can. You're funny as hell. Get out there and be funny." So I went out and bid myself. And uh, that became my biggest trade, was MC. And you replaced Diamond Lil. Pardon? You replaced Diamond Lil. Yeah, I replaced Diamond Lil at that time. Oh, okay. Is that who was fired? Yeah. Okay. They were having testicle difficulties. Mm. They were having what difficulties? Testicle difficulties. <laughs> what does that mean? That's just a play off of nuts. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm, yes. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I. But the MC is what carried me all around the country. Oh, I see. I see. I was. Uh, I was trying to think where I was working when we was. I was offered to go to Charlie Brown's cabaret. 
up in Buckhead. Wait, wait. I was out for my own show. By the time it, you would, your name had gotten yeah. taken off. Okay. I was out for my own show in Buckhead. And uh, we was there for about eight months. It was like a dinner theater, like I'm at right now. What was the name that have a... The it was called Charlie Brown's Cabaret. Okay. And formerly Tallulah. And it was formerly Tallulah's uh, Lesbian Club. Tallulah's. And a new gay okay. girls club it opened and they lost all their business, so they brought me in. Okay. And then when things started going, everybody started coming back, they said, get rid of the drag queen. Well, at that time, Backstreet walked in and offered me the third floor, which is dead on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that's where we opened up at Backstreet. Mm -hmm. So you were at uh, Charlie Brown's Buckhead for how long would you say? About six months. Oh, about six months. Okay. Not long. Okay. And uh, then we moved to Backstreet. And so this would put us probably. We opened on Backstreet Memorial Day weekend, 1990, and was there until they closed the doors. About 1990, okay. Mm -hmm. Until they closed the doors. Weekend, 1990. Yeah. You know, I want to uh, touch back on something. You mentioned something um, I heard you uh, in talking about the type of uh, performing you enjoy and how much comedy influences that. And you, mentioned Carol Burnett shows. I was kind of wondering, uh, in addition to maybe Carol Burnett and other comedians, are there people Jonathan Winters. You feel influenced by? <laughs> Any comedian. Red Skelton. Who else? Who else? Just, oh my lord. Uh, Don Rickles. I lived for Don Rickles, how he attacked the audience, and that's when I started MC, and that's what I, I would go and mess with the audience, like Don Rickles would. And to this day, I still mess with the audience. Yeah. Um, that's why I built my show at Backstreet, mm -hmm. because they would come in for a late night show, and man, I didn't let them mess with us. I mean, they were straight coming in there, rednecks, drunk from mm -hmm. other clubs, four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. They didn't mess with us. We wouldn't let them. But I would breed them to whip shit. And that's what the, the word was, don't mess with Charlie Brown. You don't mess with Charlie Brown at Backstreet. I've chased them out of the club. They spit in my face and I yanked my wig off and chased them out of the club. Because when they come, I don't give, I don't give a damn how big they were. They, when I came at them, <laughs> it was like startle them. <laughs> they were like, "Oh my God, what's going to happen?" You know, and they would they would weaken down, and I just and if I started after someone, the entire room would start singing. Na 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 na, na 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 na, and my friend, my lover was, he was the DJ, and man, he knew when, when <laughs> he knew my face when he saw it. He hit that in that whole room and started singing. They would park the water, trusting me to get that man out of there, you know. Backstreet was unreal. Some of the finest entertainers in. In the United States, came through back door. Who are some people? Through back street. Who are some folks that came? Through? Oh Lord, uh, Heather Daniels, Raven, Hot Chalk. No. Say yes to the dress. Pardon? Say yes to the dress. The guy that's doing the show in New York. He he was. Um, Brandy Alexander, Miss Gay America. He worked mm -hmm. with me until he, while he was touring out of Atlanta, put his dresses down, went to New York, went to design school, now he's on TV. He was in our show for about Ray, three years. Yeah. Bertha Butts, Satan DeVille, Brandy Dover. Oh, Lena Luss, Lorna Masters. Raven. Shauna Brooks. Those Lord the names. A good number of people. Well, if you had a name, if you were coming through Atlanta, you worked at Back Street. How would you describe like Atlanta as being the sort of 
what was the climate of drag and how important was it that what was happening in Atlanta at the time? Well, maybe in compared to other places, parts of the world. Well, any small everybody that comes to Atlanta is center of the south. Mm -hmm. It's an interstate coming in from any direction coming into Atlanta, and we were marching. We were getting our freedom here in Atlanta. And the entertainers were holding the benefits, and we were in the marches, and we were standing up for our communities. Where these smaller towns, they couldn't. They couldn't, they couldn't take the harassment. They'd be beaten, murdered, whatever, back then, you know. And they would come to Atlanta and join in. Atlanta was like the mother hub of the South. And it was the same way with Drag Queen. If you worked Atlanta, you could work anywhere in the country. Oh. Yeah, it was that hard to get into Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But at Backstreet, we always had a baby entertainer. And anybody... Someone new to the business? Yeah, no. someone, we'd always pick us a baby. And the cast of entertainers I had, we were all opposites of each other. And we all complimented each other. And we weren't stepping on each other's toes every time we walked on stage during our act. Mm -hmm. And when we pick a baby, we would all contribute into this baby and help her develop her own style, her own looks, and her own everything. Is that similar to houses and the way and drag queens taking in the, people to take care of them who may have been put off by their families or communities uh, or... We didn't have houses, but... Or maybe I'm not using the right language. Maybe. We we had apartments and two or three entertainers live together, you okay. know. Okay. And then you'd, have, you'd meet your friends and you'd have straight gay friends that live with the drag queens, okay. you know. But back then, we you developed your own family. Mm -hmm. You developed your own family. I ain't getting my makeup done. <laughs> You're doing fantastic. So. Uh, you had your own group you run with, your own family, and a lot of the entertainers, they had the house of Shawna Brooks, the house of Brooks, and it'd be different entertainers with the last name Brooks. Hmm. And, and would the person with the, that started that be considered like? The mother. The mother? The mother. Okay. Hmm. Now, does... Does that happen with many, like, like, does a drag queen... Most entertainers have similar have a similar house? Oh, yeah. oh, okay, okay. Uh, most, like, how do, you know if, how do you know if you're going to be a mother, I guess is my question. Well, it's so, just like, you meet this entertainer and you, you see a lot, you see a lot in her that she don't see. Oh, and, you know, you, you personalities work to, uh, perfect together. Mm -hmm. And you take her under your wing and start coaching her. But a good mother coaches, they don't direct them. You let her develop herself, but you are saving the rough spots, the rough mistakes. You push her, help her, and watch her grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have children? Jackson. None of them took that name Brown, but I consider everybody I've worked with my kind. Well, right now, right now I call myself Mimo. Yeah. I'm the Mima of Atlanta right now. Because I'm, I'm 69 and, and still doing shows. And every entertainer I've worked with, well, you're my grandmother because you helped this entertainer get going. You know? So I just feel like I got god kids and grandkids all over the country. I've been very lucky in my life. Very, very lucky. My career, everything. So, and, and performed in lots of places. I was going to run through some of the places you had mentioned, and um, maybe there's some that you did mention. You've anywhere from you know, starting out in Nashville, or maybe Myrtle Beach, even Raleigh, North I've Carolina, all of the Cola. I have worked Where every are? city in the East. Mm -hmm. Mid, so a lot of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I've uh, worked Lake Tahoe. I worked Las Vegas. Um, 
Denver. I mean, I've worked everywhere. Because the Atlanta Drags were the top in the business through this period, back street. And we were booked all over the country. All up Minnesota, Detroit, New Jersey, Baltimore. Loved Baltimore. There's a big queen up there named Beulah Lamont. And me and her was just, we were just our personalities were just. We were on the Sally Jesse Raphael show together. Yeah. The Sally Jesse Raphael show. No. I was the first queen to pull her wig off on the Sally Jesse Raphael show during the show. It was planned, you know. I planned it. She didn't know it. The producers said, "Would you do it?" I said, "Well, hell yeah." They said, well, "Don't tell her, don't tell her." And so they had they locked her face when I yanked my wig. Of course, you know she's not. She's freaking out. So that would have been. Let's see. Sally Jesse was the night. Was it the nineties? Yeah, early. Where was that filmed? Do you remember? That? It was filmed, filmed in Macon. It really? Was, were, well, it, do you know what? It was during the child murders in Atlanta. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember that. It was during that period. Hmm. I'm sorry, years, dates. No, no, that's okay. Even um, sometimes just having a range is. Um, so aside from, it, like you said, it's clear that emceeing is and you're, you're pretty passionate about yeah. it, even though it's kind of thrust on you, like, and someone else must have clearly believed that you could do it. Um, I assume you lip sync as well. Oh yeah, oh yes. <laughs> um, but perhaps you do one more than the other, or what do you think you've kind of, or has it been about balanced? What, in seeing or? And lip syncing, sort of, have you done kind of both? Oh, it's all together. Yeah. It's all part of the show. What are some of your uh, go-to favorite songs? I'm a bitch. Uh, I will survive with Lattice Night. Oh, okay. Anything Gladys Night did. Sorry, I'm working with my eyebrow right now. I used to do uh, uh, a lot of Sherry Bassey stuff. This is my life. Some strong anthems. Oh yeah. But I never, I never did any characterization. Uh, latter years, I do Winona as a character. She's about the only characterization I did. Winona Judd. Judd. Yeah. She's my bitch. I love her. But uh, I was, I was, I'm my character. I've always tried to sell the song seriously, but a little fun poked in there with it, you know, mm -hmm. make you enjoy it a little bit better than just watching someone just straight at Panama. Right, right. Well, and you had mentioned uh, messing, you said messing with the audience earlier. Um, but what's a typical night look like, you messing with the audience? Now, I work at Lips in Atlanta. Okay. And uh, we do birthdays and bachelorettes. And they they come to the stage and sit in a big throne like chair. And I get to interview them and I pick them apart. And like if they're from Milledgeville, I asked if they're on, out on visitation rights or something like that. If they're from oh, from Milledgeville. Yeah, if they're from Stockbridge. You work the furniture outlet, you know. Or, 
the most sort of things that are well known. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. big accused women from Marietta selling pussy in front of the big chicken. You know, I'm a dirty, dirty MC, a comical dirty MC. Uh, when I was in Lake Tahoe, you couldn't couldn't say anything dirty, so I had to work around it. And so now it plays to my advantage now working lips because it's the same type of format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering in all the places that you've worked and traveled to in the, the many years, how you've kind of changed. Like, so you mentioned going to Tahoe and maybe having to adjust uh, I to clean climate. it. Yeah. Having to clean my act up. Clean up, obviously. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But there, I, didn't, I, have do, another there I didn't do numbers. I was just the host and MC of the show. And when I was in top, you know, I did a super show in Las Vegas at the Rio. And I was the host and MC there, too. Mm. And, um, but I had to go out and sell myself, make them laugh. And be, be funny and clean at the same time. I I've, I've always been amazed that I always say I crawled my ass off of a great off of a farm. I barely got got throughout high school. I went to business college, barely completed, and. The fortune teller that said, your career is in Nashville, Tennessee. Go home. And the first night I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, I've got a place to stay and a job. And he built me there. It groomed me. And it's like I said, Everybody groomed you back then. When the Watch Hat and Coach Slim Byrne, I told you about it, Memphis, Tennessee brought our entire show to Memphis. What was the name of the saloon that burned? Watch Your Hat and Coach. Watch Your Hat, that's right. George's in Memphis brought our entire show down to Memphis. Their cast took off, and we worked. And people were bringing us bolts of fabric. He was bringing his jewelry, he was bringing their mother's old costumes. They re wardrobed us while they got ready to open it, and we, we went back, we were back together. But Memphis, Tennessee pulled all us in, and we stayed with people that worked at the bar. That's the way it was when you were gay back then. You had, you had, you had to stick together. And I was always amazed that it seemed like. Almost everything I've done in my life, it was placed there for me. It's like I tell you when I'm at Mox, I met my partner. I mean, I met him. His wife introduced us. And I laid, huh? Ex wife. <laughs> was she ex at the time? Or was she yes. uh, they were separated. They were separated. She was wanting to go to bed with me. And she said, I got a gorgeous husband, I'll bring him in, and you'll want to go to bed with him. She brought him in, and we locked eyes. And she's over here just talking, and we were just in a dead eye stare the entire time. And he made me in makeup that night. The next night, he'd come in and party with me. I was out of makeup, so he met me in and out. So he got to know both sides of me. And um, it was meant to be. And then we said, let's move to Atlanta. Like I said, we pulled in town, pulled off the interstate. He had a job within a block and a half from the interstate. We went to Cheshire Bridge that night. I got a job walking in the door. It was on Buford Highway, staying with friends, walked in the door, and the manager. It was just and like everything in my life, so it seems like it's been laid out. But I fought for it too. I've worked for it too. Did you actually grow up on a farm? 
Is that yes, I did. What kind of farm was it? Just, we had beef cows. And when I graduated from high school, that's, they sold the farm and moved to a dairy up in southern Kentucky. But I lived in the north in Tennessee. But I was up early breaking, feeding cows before I went to school, before I rode a school bus to school. But it wasn't for me. You know, you and your brothers and sisters, that sort of like <clears throat> having chores that all of you have to equally participate in? Equally my sister is to the older and married. Okay. And my brother was three years older than me, so he was helping daddy more, and daddy was having me help my mother. So you were the baby? I was the baby of the family. And, and can we take a break? Maybe with, uh, how about, let's talk about maybe your favorite costume. Something simple, something like, something that you, a memory about, <clears throat> something you. Anything that glitters, I love. <laughs> I always call myself a Jewish drag queen. What you can't wear, you carry. A Jewish drag queen? Uh -huh. What you can't wear, you carry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the younger days, it was see through costume. I'll see through, and, uh, I should have done this while we have broken. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, I've changed with the age. Of course, the body's changed. I've changed with styles of clothes and everything. Uh, one thing I've always truly enjoyed was decorating. I've always, earlier days, I used to make mine. And then I started getting them made, and then I'd decorate them. I'd order jewels, beads, and stuff from New York, feathers. I'm working with some stuff now. I'm trying to get my wardrobe to where I can totally rotate every week in and out of the club I'm working right now, the dinner theater I'm working at. Expensive now. What's the dinner theater you're working at now? I work at Lips. That's right. Down Buford Highway. Uh, we serve, we do Wednesday one show, Thursday one show, and I do two shows on Friday and the first two shows on Saturday. They do three shows. I do two on Saturday. So that rounds out to and the And then they do two on Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm semi-retired and that's my playground now. I don't have to travel. I toured a lot. Always in between jobs, you're on the road. But having coming from Atlanta, it's always easier to get a booking. And being on HBO and everything, and being the producer of Charlie Brown's Cabaret Backstreet, I've always had great opportunities to work all over the country. And one thing I like about traveling is when you work with a place, I think you get stale because you get fall into doing the same format every night. And when you travel, you don't know who you're working with. You don't know who's coming to the show. And I always said that most people's heard of, some, a third of the people's heard of you. A third of the people see you, and a third of them don't give a damn. You've got to go in and prove to the people that have seen you and come back to see you why they came back. You've got to prove to the one third that heard of you why they heard of you. And the one third that don't give a damn, it's probably ain't going to give a damn anyway. So you work for the two third house. Is there a lot of rehearsing that goes into performing? It, de it depends. If you're a dancer, you have your own styles. You, over the years, you develop your own style, and so the music you would pick would be 
the kind of music that goes with your style. So you, basically, you're just changing your costume, mm -hmm. changing your look, maybe adding some new dance, changing your music. Mm -hmm. But you keep your style that's selling. If you got something that sells, you keep it and work it and move it constantly. Sorry, this is the hardest part. It's wet. I'm working with eyeliner. Have you ever really seen a show? I have. I have. Uh, quite a few. Quite a few. I haven't seen you, though. Well, you need to come to Lips. You are... Right on about that. <laughs> where is Lips in Atlanta? On Buford Hop. You know where the Pink Pony is? No. The Pink, that strip club on Pink? I've heard of it. You know where North Druid is? I do. You know where uh, Wells Fargo is? The corn block down past? I do. We're next door okay. to Wells Fargo. Okay. Pink Pony sits right behind us. Okay. The strip club. Hmm. We meet there Wednesday, well, Friday, Friday, Thursday. And, yeah, and I'm there Friday and Saturday. Hmm. You were talking a little bit about how um, certainly your costumes change over time because you change and fashion changes, I assume. Um, but then you kind of said how you, when you get a sense of what your strengths are and what's doing well, you kind of market it and push it. I think is what you said. Yeah. What are some What are some other things that that change? You think over the course of your career so far as a direct performer. One thing I've really noticed that's changed right now is that RuPaul's Drag Race show uh -huh. uh, when. My makeup, I learned to do makeup to look real. Mm -hmm. Because. Real? You look like a real woman. Mm -hmm. little, too much makeup, but look like a real woman. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the makeup for drag is super flamboyant. Just super huge mm -hmm. lashes, huge lips, huge eyes, and huge hair. And Atlanta is still the. They like to see you as a man and then come out and crack their faces as a woman. That's what it used to be in Atlanta. But now, Atlanta's going into the trends, changing over to the root Paul style, mm -hmm. which it's good. Drag me changes, I guess, but everything. I, I'm an old dog. You can't teach old dogs any tricks, but you try to change your makeup, your styles, and your looks, and Keep going. <laughs> uh, RuPaul's done a lot for drag. Mm. Just like my days at Backstreet. I mean, I was in this Sunday papers. I was, you know, magazines, all the local TV shows. Backstreet diapered hundreds of thousands of gay guys and girls. Diaper. That's where they come to come out. I love that. Yeah. They diapered. Just, uh, just be to be themselves. be themselves. They found their freedom at Backstreet for the first time in a lot of his lives. And to this day at work, I have people come up and say, you do not know what you did for me back in Backstreet Days. Mm -hmm. How you, I asked you a question, you got at me in this direction, or just hearing you talk on stage, you made me feel proud that I was a gay man or a gay woman to stand up for your rights and fight for yourself and fight for your community. What's it like for you to hear those things even today? You know that one thing that stirs me more than anything to hear 
my mom and daddy met at your show. <laughs> <laughs> That means they're 21 years old and in a bar watching me. <laughs> That's what disturbs me. <laughs> you know, I'm an old seasoned entertainer. I can't please everybody. But you may not have known me when you come in. Junior, forgive me when you leave. I will make that impression on you. And it's from my heart. It's not, you know, I make you leave there. She was fun, or, you know, I had such a good time. And that's what it's all about, it's making them forget. I just wish you could have been at Backstreet. Elton John used to come in and sit at you in the bar. We wouldn't recognize him. Janet Jackson walked in with her entourages. Uh, you go in the bathroom, look on the wall in there. Sign posters from billboards, Fox, mm -hmm. biggest plays. Mm -hmm. What was her name, Brad? Uh, did the back flip? Oh, uh, it's right there. Anyway, she. I lost that lady. You lost that lady. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you said something beautiful off camera. I, I think it might be pretty impactful. What? Losing my leaves? Yeah, about that. About a friend of mine going to the doctor because she's having a hard time remembering. He did all the examinations on her and he, and he said, Well, oh, honey. He said, you know, your brain is like a tree. It's got all these limbs. And sweetheart, you're losing your leaves. And I'm losing my leaves, y'all. I'm 69 and three and one fourth. <laughs> three months into it. <laughs> my age, you count those fours. But the gay life in Atlanta, it's always been wonderful. Is it different here versus other big other cities and small towns you've been to? I, well, small towns I know it's better, a hundred percent better. You have better opportunity to be gay and have a good job. Mm. In a smaller town, you gay people know it, you're gonna have a hard time getting a good job. Mm. Uh, but Atlanta's always been there for the our community. It stood up. And I think they've done a great job. Lennon's got a beautiful community. We're free. But we paid our dues for it too. <laughs> oh, I was giving you a moment. I don't know if you were. You were, you were yeah, I was. But was I intense. was trying to think at the same time for yeah. something to say yeah. to you. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I was just, wasn't sure if you were there. You know, because I, because I was also taken by the makeup, your makeup coming together. And, um, imagine it must Years. feel a certain <laughs> way, but like, like when you see it go, go from. From no makeup to to full makeup and then costumes. What is that like? And you. Well, you. It's like being an artist. Then you 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 picture. Like you sit down and you picture what you want to paint, and the difference in me and an artist is I've got the same mat to work with every damn time. <laughs> 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 So, <laughs> at 69, I know where the wrinkles are on the cover. <coughs> yeah, crack filler. <laughs> yeah, crack filler. Use them fallen leaves to fill in. <laughs> One of my favorite 
Thatch and Backstreet was when uh, old politicians came up in there. And uh, had John Lewis, Barney Frank. Uh, John Lewis, Barney Frank. Uh, uh, Shirley. Young and, uh, Shirley came in? No, Shirley did not come She in. didn't? No, Shirley did not come in. But was, was this all the same night? No, no, not. it was all at the same time. They were stumbling for votes for, I, I think. They were wanting to gain John community. Lewis was running for uh, re election. And uh, Backstreet was basically the gay town hall. And so they come there and they begged me to let them walk on stage for me, me to announce them that it was my favorite, you know, this is my pick because I had it. the gay community. Do you have any more Charlie Brown for mayor pins that you can give me? I think I got one on my jacket. I was bartending at uh, the bar on. Uh, no, it was. I'll work. Burkhart's. Burkhart's. When it opened, I was the bartender on the main floor, and the mayor race was running, and I bartended in drag and then did shows that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, mayor races were going on, so I had buttons made, charged around for mayor, and I couldn't come make fast enough. They sold like hotcakes. And the gay community come to me and actually wanted me to run so they could see, just see how many gay votes there was. And I said, yeah, no, <laughs> it's too much dirt in my closets, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that leaf hadn't fallen at the time, you know. <laughs> but it was nice that, you know. But they said I had a lot of write-ins, a lot of kids. I broke your name in. I wrote, I heard that a hundred times that my name was wrote in. Because nobody liked anybody that was running. Mm. How would that have, uh, at the time, was there a, a Point of a part of you that thought for like even a split second, okay. maybe, maybe I should, maybe I, maybe I should. Is this something I could do? You know, run for mayor or or be a politician? Ah, uh, that time. Given that you were, you were at a that time, at time, yeah, you, know? that, it, you just didn't do it if you were gay. I see. Because I mean, Atlanta was still very racist, and then they still are, but you know. What was it like to be a, a customer at Back Street, to walk in the door and... Because um, it sounds like it was pretty accepting of everybody. Whoever the best had. music, the best disco music, the best light show, the best dance floor, and the best party favorites you could get. Mm -hmm. they, they were there. No matter what you wanted, you could get it at Back Street. But at that time, you could get it in almost any club you wanted to. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, you know, most people brought their own backstreet because it's so expensive, you know. But most expensive, what do you mean? Drugs. Oh. Like most expensive to get in? Like... You're buying your drugs are a little bit more expensive because you're buying them in the middle of a nightclub, you know. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Was there, there were the, something different on each floor? Like what was the difference? You walked in and it was pool tables. And a circular bar, gift shop. Gift shop? Yeah. And then you went down the steps and there's huge dance floor with bathrooms up under and over to the side of the circular bar. Now this is one floor downstairs, first floor, second floor. And then you went up to the third floor. The first room you walked in was cut out overlooking the, disc, the dance floor downstairs. And then you step through and then you come into a big showroom where it was all glass in. Mm -hmm. Just that big deck out there. So it was three floors. What, what was the building before it was back? Before it was back it's like a phenomenal building. It was some big, Fred will know, it was some big singers club. Oh. I can't think of Leaf. Leaf. <laughs> Thank you for understanding. <laughs> so 
kind of a strange sort of question. Who, and, and I'm curious about your answer. Who, who can do drag, in your opinion? It's kind of a big question. I think just about anybody can do drag. Mm -hmm. If you get, now anybody just can't be good at it. You just, it's just, if you're talented, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But some, I know some people that can tear the stage up and can't do their makeup. And I know people that can paint the most gorgeous face and do the most best costume, the best hair, and can't do nothing on stage to sell it. Mm. So just, and you have to really want to because it's real hard to get in. Because for every, I'd say every entertainer working in Atlanta, there's 10 here wanting to work. And in the smaller towns that, that do have shows, if they have shows, same thing. You have to, you have to be good to maintain and keep your job. Has that changed over time? You think? No. You have to. You have to begin there. You have to fight and keep it. You mentioned RuPaul earlier. I was thinking, wondering how. Um, and, and how RuPaul has done a lot. I was wondering what you, what, what has, what does that mean? What has done a... Well, he's on TV. Yeah. His show's on TV. Yeah. And every teenage girl and everything, they love his show. Yeah. And it, it's fun. They learn makeup. Mm -hmm. The girls still, you know. But it's really brought Greg to the open world. Would you say mainstream? Yeah. He put it in every TV in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. TV, you know, in the whole country. Mm -hmm. What do people get not get by watching on TV versus going to see a show? You know, like watching Drew Paul versus coming to see like a Charlie Brown show. Well, you can go to the bathroom anytime you want to, you didn't stop it during the show. But if you go to the bathroom, you may miss something in my show. Because I'd be I'd bring the bachelorettes on the stage and they'd say, What? <laughs> what? She's in the bathroom! <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, it's more personal. You're right there and you, you're interacting with the audience. I mean, we don't sit on stage all the time, we're all over our room. We're, up dancing up between the tables and you know all over the room so you're more in, interactive with it after all these years what uh how is drag still fulfilling I mean, it's a job. For me? It's a job. It's a career. It it's too. a career. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and it's still a challenge. Yeah. I mean, like That's I said, I'm, I'm hosting at one of the best dinner theaters in Atlanta. And it's a ton of queens that would love to have my job, you know. So I have to keep my P's and Q's. I have to keep my costumes fresh, my material fresh. Even though our show is basically set, I still work with my monologue, changing it around and working with it. Hmm. And every night's different. Every night's different. Every person walks on that stage, you don't know what you, that I'm fixing. I'm fixing the face. I may face this sweetest old woman. You just want you want to just take all your jewelry off and hand it to her. Or you want to take something and beat the hell out of them, you know. So you you have to learn and work with that and deal with that and learn how to read people. And I learned also, you can say almost anything you want to if you're smiling. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, I, can see, I can see that. The one thing I really read about this is I, I can't remember all the dates and it's just, 
the land is unbelievable. It's been unbelievable. And not just for me, but the gay community. Mm -hmm. You you said earlier about how you described it as <clears throat> seeming like things would line up and you'd move, go somewhere and this would be like it was meant to be and then this would be meant to be. Um, I imagine that there's also been challenges, struggles, oh, uh, yeah. certain uh, along the way. Um, what, what, what were some tough moments you know, about being a drag queen? Acceptance. Being accepted. Uh, people hollering at you because I have no eyebrows. I can't believe I live in Cobb County and I'm totally accepted in this community. Just I, I didn't a single person point or say nothing to me. I've lived out here 14 years, mm -hmm. 16 years. Mm -hmm. Do what? We've been out here 20 years. 20 years this September. 20 years this September. And I, I didn't have one person point or comment. I've heard people, I know you. I recognize that voice <laughs> at Walmart or you know somewhere at the bank. Do you work at Lips? Are you Charlie Brown? I get that a lot, you know. Makes you feel good. Tell them what our yard man says. Oh, our yard, our yard man. I didn't know he knew. Was talking. He said, "Oh, everybody knows who you are." I said, "What?" He said, "Oh, everybody knows you work down there at that club. You wear dresses." Said, who knows? He said, "The whole neighborhood." <laughs> and that was news to you. And like, yeah, because you know, I got these trees on each side. I leave through the drive, drive-in garage, and pull back in and drag. You know, late night come. I don't flash. Well, like, like you said, I you don't see drag in my house because that's my job. You mentioned that a moment. You mentioned that off camera. And I enjoy it more. Yes. I appreciate it more. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, time to get in it. Right. I'm not sitting here looking at this all day. I set it up. I take it down. I set my island back up. Set my kitchen back up. What 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 would what do you appreciate more? Every night I'm on that stage. The career I've had and still get to enjoy entertaining. I had a 93-year-old woman come in that show the other night. Wow. And she looked like she was 70. But she told me, because after the show, after I pick them, I always go around and thank everybody at the tables and thank you for letting me, you know, messing with me and stuff. She said, sweetheart, she said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, it's been years since I've left this heart. She said, I will never forget you, and I'll be back. And she took her hand and put it in my hand, and she dropped like 80 cents. And she took my hand and shook it. She said, that's all I had, and I want you to have it. And she said, I will be back, and I'll bring a lot more money. <laughs> but that, just that eighty cents was worth a million dollars to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause she said to me, "It's been years since I've laughed so hard." Mm -hmm. Now, how would that make you feel? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm getting water just thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it's moments like that, it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, when AIDS broke out in Atlanta, several kids got it and they couldn't go home for Christmas and things. And Did you people close to you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I knew. But. The club baths were wild back then, and right. that's where it spread. And every, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just gay life was just wild. Right. Um, I started Christmas for PWAs through Aid Atlanta. They just established Aid Atlanta, and 
Me and the entertainers of Atlanta, we held benefits in every club in this city. At the time, there was a lot of clubs. We would take jars and tape, seal them, and walk into a club and let the manager know we were there to collect for Christmas for PWAs. And we PWA, walk, what is it? Christmas for people with AIDS. People with AIDS. We would walk through and collect the money and go to the office, give it to the manager. He would untape it, count it. At Atlanta? It. Huh? At Atlanta? Yeah. No, the office of the club, oh, the, the bar club. we were in. Oh, I see. They would untape it, count the money, and give me a receipt that we collected this amount of money at this date. Mm. I kept the receipts. And then the 1st of December, we'd have a big, huge benefit at Backstreet. And this is before I was working there. And all the club owners and managers would come in and they'd bring a check for the amount that we'd raised in their club. And we'd raised ten, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. That money was turned over to Eight Atlanta that night. Within two weeks, it was broken down into checks to each PWA in Atlanta, Georgia. And we helped them get home for Christmas. Maybe their last. And if they couldn't get home, they could send their families something. Or they could have a Christmas here. But we did that for years until it got to be so many that we couldn't do it anymore. We couldn't raise enough money for them to get anything decent. Now, you know. But that's what your female impersonators did it like during those rough days. We worked. We have benefits for the AIDS. We have the AIDS organizations get started through their money when the government wasn't paying it. The entertainers of Atlanta have been grand old bitches. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's been a while. Now it's been a while since I've talked about that. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Oh, he's being good. I can't believe that. I'm talking about the dog, y'all. <laughs> Rusty. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of, uh, what is it? Rusty? He's a Cavalier Rusty. King Charles Spaniel. He's beautiful. Yeah. They're, they call the people's dog. They just absolutely love yeah. males. Mm -hmm. The males love males. Mm -hmm. Oh, they get. Oh, they just love being around a man. Have you always had dogs? Yeah. Yeah. This is their second Cavalier. Um, I had lots of opsis. I've used them in contests and sportswear and stuff. And yeah. Things like that. See where am I at my makeup? Okay. So this, where, what is this? Like, if we were to say, are you like three quarters of the way through? How, how does it? And uh, over half. Okay. okay. Yeah. I was good. I'm putting the colors on now. That was good. Got my nose running from that discussion about Peter. But you know, that's some of my proudest moments. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't just me, it was all the entertainers. Yeah. When Eight Atlanta got started, every time I went out town, I would take brochures to these small communities mm -hmm. on prevention, safety, what to look out for, sick, you know, signs, you may have it. Well, and this would have uh, the, the late 90s, early, late yeah. 80s, early 90s? Yeah. Okay. Early 80s.
It sounds like that there were quite a few more clubs in Atlanta. Oh. Uh, how was it? At one time, that? we had like at least five sh full show bars, and that, that when I say full show bars, those were doing shows six and seven nights a week, uh -huh. and they would have eight to ten entertainers. Uh -huh. They'd have two to three male entertainers to do in the production work. And the rest of the drag queens, you have choreographers, had seamsters, and costume designers for the production work we did. And uh, we did a, when Bette Miller came out with the rose, I did a special, an evening with Bette. I was on stage at the Gumhead for two and a half hours. And they changed my costumes on me. We did an entire Bette Miller concert. And they danced, we did, it went from production into song, into production, into song, into production. And it won all the awards. And at that time it was named, at that date, it was one of the best productions in Atlanta they ever seen. And we had a repeat of it and everything. It was grandiose. Mm -hmm. Now are all these awards tucked away in your, your room where all of your costumes are? You Honey, I'm so old. Most of them had dry rot and broke and lost in moves. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like when AOL come out, right at the end of AOL, I was just going to redo my website. I gave him all my pictures. He was going to just, well, hadn't heard from him in two weeks. No answer. Run into his friends. Oh, he moved from Jacksonville, Florida. Never seen or heard from him since. All my shit. Went with him. Then come find out later, about a month and a half after he moved there, he got evicted. And all the stuff ended up in trash cans. Hmm. So I lost all my costume, you know, all my makeup, not makeup, all my pictures and mm -hmm. Like when I went Miss Georgia, pictures of that and stuff, I can't get no more of, you know. Mm. But it was up in here till the leaves fell out. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what kind of. Uh... Shared language, would you say, is specific to the drag performance? Okay, what? Like, like words that you maybe have even come up with yourself just by the ev evolution of drag. Like that, y'all say something and y'all only know what that means, and then that's maybe that's been made more popular now. Ah, uh, like what's? I don't, I don't you know what about I mean? any of that. Well, like, like, I imagine that in being a comedian, there might be some things that that you say, and is it stuff you pick up in pop culture and in politics that, like, how do you know what to kind of mess with and poke at? And I just, I listen to the news and go with the flow and find out, that, like, what's going on in the communities that my customers are coming from or try to pick on something of that, like, the, like I said earlier, the stock bridge, that's your furniture outlet. Marietta is your big chicken. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Milledgeville is a crazy bitch is out on, you know, visitation, you know. Stock bridge, uh, Woodstock is all the employees at Walmart. Stock bridge, you said? Yeah. But I... I I'm surprised some stuff that falls out of my mouth. I don't even think. I've always been like that even as a kid. I, funny things just fell out of my mouth. I don't even think they just, and then I go, damn, where'd that come from, you know? But that's. You surprise yourself sometimes? Yeah, a lot of times. So when you come out and uh, do you uh, kind of get a, how do you get a sense of who's in the audience? Do you sort of ask some questions or, um, it sounds not, like you're very audience focused, like getting a sense of who's in the audience. So you can well, my part, like I go through and look who's wearing the crowns, 
and tiaras. Tiaras are bachelorettes, and I kind of watch them at their tables because that's all I do is MC where the other entertainers wait on tables and stuff. I only MC. So I get that opportunity to watch them, and I can see if, if there was a t table of rednecks, like we'll have six day couples. I mean, red redneck. Those are lips? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can tell the guys are sitting there like this. And then they, they start easing in, you know. But that's, I, that's, I just judge people. I don't know. I've got a good judgment of people. And that sort of, it doesn't feel like it came kind of naturally, like natural uh -huh. to you. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of keen observation. It's like I said, even when I was growing up, I'd turn the commercials down and I'd make up lines for them and I'd have my mother and daddy laugh and I'd make up my own lines to the commercial that was on TV, you know. Yeah. I've always been very witty like that. Yeah. And so as you do it as a job, it just, you learn, you, you say something, you're locked in. Uh -huh. And that situation comes up again, you don't have to think about it, it just rolls off the tip of your tongue. Uh -huh. A lot of, I have my base conversation and my base monologue that I open with and then I vary off and play off a bit and try to work it around and constantly trying to, you know, that it doesn't sound like it's the identical same thing every time you see me. It's a little something different every time. Yeah. Yep. Fred, why don't you hand me my glasses on the dining room table? Assess, assess where we're at, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I got blew up my eyelashes. Ah, oh, I see. The tarantulas. <laughs> What's your average time getting ready these days? You know, I can do it in 45 minutes if I have to. Oh. But it's taking longer today talking, you know. Sure. And, uh, but I like to take my time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll sit down and do my makeup, start doing it, and then I'll take a break, go smoke a doobie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 420. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out in the sunroom? Yeah. Yeah. How long do you think you'll work? As long as I'm enjoying it. Because you mentioned retirement earlier, and I know there's a. Um, I'm not sure if people ever really retire. I don't think so now, these days. Yeah. People ain't gonna be able to. Yeah. But I'll work as long as I'm enjoying it. I mean. I, I can't see sitting here seven days a week, day after day after day. So I look so forward to leaving on Friday to go into work. I know I've got traffic from hell going in at six o'clock at night, going to downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. I enjoy it. I take my time and enjoy it. This is the best thing about drag now for me is before I was a show director, co-producer, my partner produced most of our shows at, Lip, at Back Street. Fredo? Yeah. He was the sound man, the engineer, and... Well, I was about to say what goes into that, the production part side of things. Yeah. Well, we didn't do production, but we had all kinds of special effects. I could do, I could go, ha, 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 and go into Freddy Krueger's voice. Oh. All right, just like anything I said, like, I, he could tell by one tone, he'd kick in, he knew I was fixing to throw somebody out. We were that... In sync. in sync, that he knew everything I was thinking on that stage and where I was headed with it, and he had a special sound effect for it. And I'm telling you about how we were at Backstreet, how sync we were, and you had special effects for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, channel two yeah, or two instant replays. We had a pair of instant replay uh, sound effects machines, like they use in you know their digital cart machines, like using radio stations. Yeah. We had. The entire Hanna Barbera car cartoon sound effects library on it, you know, with all kinds of crazy. You know. It was fun. Channel Two come in and did a special on our show. They plugged into Fred's soundboard. He won an Oscar. 
Uh, an Emmy, wasn't it? An Emmy. It won an Emmy for sound effects. Fred didn't. The guy from Channel 2. He took credit for it. Oh, and it, all he did was plug into print. But he won, won a, a local Emmy uh, for an outstanding achievement in audio. How about shit? I had people congratulating me for two months. Hey, man. <laughs> I said, okay. I didn't win nothing. Still a little bitter, huh? Oh, yeah. Boy, it worked for the show, though. Oh, yeah. We were so in sync, man. We would sit here and think of something, and he would go, wait a minute, and he'd go in there and pull some music up, and it would go with whatever it was talking about. Uh, the Teletubbies, when they were claiming the Teletubbies were gay, we, were, we went and bought a Teletubby tape, and we put on this one part, and we watched it through once, and Fred said, give me a minute. He went in and pulled out YMCA, and it fit to the beat of the part that we were watching. I mean, to the, them walking, to the, them, to the step, them carrying on doing something. It was unbelievable. People begged for that every night they walked in the flood. We just had to do it two to three times a night because the crowd turned over constantly. But that's what makes the show. This is added attractions, and we add them. Well, like I said, HBO come and this MTV named our show one of the best in the world. They did a, a thing called Forbidden Places, and they came. Huh? HBO did. No, that was the Travel Channel. Travel Channel did oh, a travel thing channel. called uh, Forbidden Places. And, Exclusive ac access. We did places exclusive access. And they came to the club and filmed us. And they spent the day with me. So you were the forbidden place? Yeah, their show was. Dr oh. The dressing room, behind the scenes of oh. female impersonator. Oh. That particular episode, they ran his uh, show and uh, featured a. Uh, Decommissioned uh, uh, nuclear warhead launch place, uh, one of those silos, missile silos out west. Uh, behind the scenes of the new Cirque du Soleil show at Disney World. Then they, it was Charlie at Backstreet, and then it was on tour with the Moody Blues on their private jet. That I was, was on that show with them. That hmm. was. That was the uh, show that they aired that wow. Charles was in. It's kind of a family operation you've got here to some degree. Yeah. Like two I mean, partners working together. That's like I said, uh, I would have never achieved a third of what I've done if it had been for my partner because he's always been my rock. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the one that said, You can do this. And I said, I can't do this. And he said, you're going to sing with a band. You're on a stage with thousands of people. I said, you're kidding. I'll never do that. I did the pot festival with the band behind me. The what festival? The Marijuana Pot Festival. The last one they had in Atlanta, I was one of the features with a band. He was the MC. And the MC of it. And I had backstreet prop people to make me a six-foot marijuana joint out of chicken wire and cover it with papers. Cover it with papers. And they had smoke bombs. And they had like red confetti stuff at the front like it looked like something and smoking out the back of it. And I said, I saved all my roaches and brought them to you and hung that place. <laughs> they handed that off the stage and The uh, bands that were uh, the headliners were Green Day and 311. And this was at Piedmont Park. Charlie was the MC. MTV was. Uh, Is this 94? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Saturday, April 2nd. Oh, yeah. And uh, when they said, Would you MC it? Uh, 
He said, yeah, and I said, do you want to MC it? Do you want to steal the damn show? And he said, well, what you got in mind? And I called uh, the guys over at the Masquerade and put out an uh, all-points bulletin that I needed some pickers. And in a week, we put together a fucking band, and he did Cheech and Chong's Earache My Eye. <laughs> <laughs> the, the place, fucking, how long have you guys fucking been together? <laughs> it was it was fucking badass. I guess you stole the show. Pretty much. Some guy threw a coke on me. Threw a beer on you. While what? I was doing my show. Threw a beer up on me, and man, the security grabbed him, and all I could see was people jumping over security, popping that guy in the head with cans, anything they could hit him with. Security couldn't keep people from beating him. Because he threw a beer on Charlie while he was doing his dumb. They about beat the shit out of that fellow. The poor old MTV people, when he passed it, well, he had two leather boys to pass the... the fake joint, it was just a chicken wire and a, and a piece of conduit wrapped in paper mache with a smoke bomb on the end. <laughs> but they tore it apart like it was fucking, you know, Panama Red or some shit, you know. And uh, the MTV camera crew about That's got sweet. trampled. They were came to Backstreet later that night and bitched like hell about it. That's so, the only art of archive that I have found of anything of that except for some photographs that we dug up the other day. Coalition for the Abolition of Marijuana Prohibition. Uh, Fifth Annual. Fifth so, Annual. That was the last one that they uh, had. They wouldn't give them a permit for the sixth and they tried to have it and they were <laughs> busting mm -hmm. everybody and ran them off. Mm -hmm. But Fred, there was Fred, probably 20,000. Under the bathroom sink, would you hand me the hairspray? Sure. Looks like the voice logo kind of does. It does, yeah. <laughs> so you get, it, it's clear to me that you get a pretty diverse turnout to your show. Oh, yeah. Has that always been that way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at Backstreet, I had a bigger straight follower than I did gay follower. How do you make sense of that? They enjoyed me. And it well, was... of course they enjoyed you. I made them laugh. Is, I... Is that a sign of acceptance? I think so. Hmm. I was. Yeah. Hmm. Right. And straight girls just wanted to hang with me. I, mean, I didn't want to hang with them. I wanted to hang with their boyfriends. <laughs> the straight girls wanted to hang with you. Well, it's like I met him. Yeah. We ran around together two weeks. I wanted rape him the first night I saw him. He was straight. We ran around two weeks and he said, I'm coming for you. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've fallen in love with you. Mm -hmm. I said, you have to take it easy. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I trained him right. Ah, <laughs> ah, ah. We're together. Yeah, I was kind of wondering how, you know, at the time, how you thought about, you know, dis describe maybe your own sort of sexuality and how that changed and your, your gender. Oh, I thought changed. I was a woman for a little while when I was younger, you know. Uh -huh. Like, like single, like teens or? No. Super, super young? I remember 20s when I was still in drag, you know, and I thought I was the last little fish, you know, but uh -huh. I grew out of it. Like I said, when I met Fred, uh, I met him as a woman first night, next night man, next night man. I met him on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'd run around together as guys getting high. And then he was around being dragged Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I went him up real quick, but I laid the trap. <laughs> I laid the trap. Yeah. What do you well, that's it. That's it? I hope that's enough. It's, it's beautiful. Now, so just left would be putting on the wig before a show, huh? Yeah. Do you want to finish product? Absolutely. Well, I, have, Absolutely. I can't do it right here, so 
and y'all have to catch cameras on. Oh, okay, well, we'll do that. Well, the, only, the, the, the one more thing, last thing I was thinking about, and that really struck by this, <coughs> um, yeah, this idea of acceptance and how integral you, specifically, and drag queens are in that, um, and how that's changed over time, and is it, is it getting better, even yeah. still today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Between it's, the L, the G, it's just like the B, I, like I tell you, we have couples, it's up to six couples come in. Yeah. The wives want to go to this show. You're going to go with me. Yeah. And they're very hesitant about it. And when I leave, because I said I always walk around every table in that room, and we see 240 people, and we sold out shows, I go to every table and thank them. Hope they enjoyed the show. Please come back. And the guys, a lot of them, would, that was so fantastic, you know. They, it really opened their eyes. Yeah. They, what, what they expected. Yeah. It was fun. And I feel like, that's, that to me, that's great acceptance that you, you see this redneck sitting there looking at you like, mm -hmm. don't come near me, you know. And then at the end of the show, he's shaking your hand or handing you a $10 bill, the extra 10 at the end of the show, you know. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. We'll be back. I'm going to bring my friends. That's that's good acceptance to me. It's, you did something. You yeah. got somewhere. Yeah, I got somewhere. I opened somebody's eyes. Huh. Huh. And then at the same time, you get that appreciation like that. So you that 93-year-old woman. Sweetest woman. I'll never forget her as long as I live. I'll never forget her. I won't lose that leaf. Because the look in her eyes as she was sitting there, and I saw that she absolutely did laugh for the first time that she had in years. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that, to me, that's the true entertainment in me. The entertainer that goes and digs and brings it out. And I do it without even thinking. It just, I'm drawn to it, I guess, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think it'll, the idea about LGBTQ, you know, the whole letters that represent a community, um, it seems to be getting more letters, you know, but, <laughs> How do you make sense of that as a, as a drag queen who's been in the business? I don't try to. Yeah. We're gay. Yeah. You're gay, you're gay. Because a lot of people... No matter what color it is, gay yeah. is gay. Yeah. Well, because I hear, you hear a lot of people use the Q word today. Yeah. That's your millennial queers. Mm -hmm. What did you say? The millennial. Oh, the millennial queers. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it? Does it... What, how does that rest with you? How does that set with me? Yeah, when you're, when you're... I don't care. You know, I'll do any benefit I can. I'll do anything I can to help the earth community better itself. If that is helping our community, I'm all for it. But yeah. I'm not one to judge and put it down for it because they're individuals fighting for their rights like I did back in 1979 and 80. You know, yeah. when it was rough here, I was fighting for the rights for people. And that's what they're doing. They fought to get that queer on that name. Now, they, they were, evidently, that's, that opened the door. Is there anything that you can think of that I, that, that in our talking that I haven't asked, or haven't, we haven't touched on that you think would be important to say or share? We covered a lot of terrain and... Yeah, I, you, I, I wish I could be more detailed in the clubs and things. I hope I've opened your eyes and your eyes to a few things of the days gone by. Mm -hmm. And there are more to come. There are more to come. Uh, I'm very comfortable with my job. Lips is give me the honor of just being the MC. I've always, like I said, been the, the host and MC. I've been the show director, producer, co-producer. And you have six, seven entertainers to work with that night under you. Two's gonna be in a bad mood and you've got to deal with it all night long, plus go out and sell yourself. When Lips offered me this grand opportunity, I told him, I said, I wanna be me. I don't want to direct, I don't want to produce, I want to be Charlie Brown. 
it's time that I went in semi-retirement. I'm semi-retired from taking care of everybody else. I won't take care of me. And they, I don't, I mean, if someone calls in sick, I don't have to look for someone to take their place. If they're in a bad mood, I don't have to talk to them. I go on with my job, do my thing. And I'm enjoying drag tremendously now. I really enjoy doing it. There was periods I hated to go in, but I had to. But once I got there and got into the show, and when the show started, I'm okay. Because I'm doing what I love. But it's all the bullshit around it's what you, you know. It's never, it hadn't always been grand, it's been rough. We, when I was entering pageants, before I won Miss Georgia, I was in pageants. Fred was working overtime and we was eating crystal hamburgers and tuna fish sandwiches for weeks on weeks on weeks because we were buying me a dress for the beauty pageant at evening gown. Then I had to have sportswear. Then I had to have talent. Then you had to pay your dancers, your choreographers, your seamstress, your hairdressers. It cost a lot of money. He worked overtime. So I could do it. And when I was doing the Christmas for PWAs, I'd miss work. He was working overtime at his job that would free me up to work for these people and help their kids with AIDS. I could never have done none of it without my lover. Thank you so much for sharing this Thank you. with me and with everybody. Um, all of this is going to be memorialized in history for some time to come, along with Think the whole... That bitch was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> she was smoking crack. I had my drug days. Uh, but we all did. But one day, we looked at each other and said, you know, we need to buy a house. We need a car. Yeah. And we ain't going to do it doing drugs. And we quit drinking. We quit doing our drugs. We cleaned our acts up. Within one month, we said, oh my God, look how much money we're making. Within three months, we bought a car. I got credit. Within two years, we bought this house. Because we cleaned up. Then we're still clean. We smoke pot. But it's for my ailments. <laughs> it's for my bones. <laughs> well, thank you for but, inviting us into your home. You're welcome. This is very personal. I, I, I've enjoyed going back, visiting a lot of the times I hadn't thought about in years. Yeah. Especially the, the PWAs. Yeah. You made a huge impact. They still need us. They still need us. Now, I'm going to slide in the other room and put a wig on, a dress, and some tubes. <laughs> and we'll pause for night. All right, and I'll be right back. See what I like it? You saw me sitting here, an old bald-headed fat man, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the transformation. It's a, I'm awestruck. It's beautiful. Uh, you do love me. the glitter. You said you did. You oh. do. It's, 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 it's part drag, man. Yeah. You've got to have the glitz, the glam. Yeah. And um, hopefully I've got enough on. <laughs> Now this is an interesting wig. Tell me about it. It's got some curl and some like. Yeah, it's just style with different that. styles of wigs that come out. Huh. Uh, wigs, wig stores now are heaven for drag queens. It almost any look you want, any color you want, it's there now. Huh. But that is the style of clothes that change now that, you know, you can buy stuff like this on the, in stores now. Mm. But we, I have it made. Oh, I can get me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You still have someone make. Uh, Pardon? You have them. Someone. You have uh, your own person. Yeah, I have someone who makes my clothes, but I dress them up. I costume it. Yeah. But this was our fabric was done like this. Yeah. With the infamous coffee brewing in the background. Yes, my coffee's brewing. <laughs> <laughs> Will you get the final word? Mr. Charlie Brown. Never give up on your dreams. What you want is there if you work for it. If you give up, you'll never see it. But if you keep going, 
taking that step forward. You may not always achieve it, but you're working in the right direction and you're getting closer to what you want. And if you get there, hang on to it when you get it. You have to fight to keep it. And don't forget what got you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. This opportunity, this honor, this is a big part of the end of the bucket list, you know. It's part of the bucket list. You give me another achievement. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Atlanta. And thank you, everybody that's ever supported me in my career. I've never forgotten. You're beautiful. Thank you. Well, there goes the makeup. <laughs> <laughs>